And I think this is one of the most important parts. You've seen when Walmart announced it was acquiring Jet and invest more heavily in a marketplace solution, their stock got a huge boost. As we look at can this be done? And you know, if so, how do we pay for it? I think it would really pay for itself. I think the first landlord to announce they're doing this would be rewarded by analysts and investors and hopefully their tenants as well who need this help to go to an omnichannel presence. I think the rewards would be immense and they would see a huge boon in their stock price that, that could really just offset the cost of investment for doing it. Not to mention build new bridges out to those digitally native retailers that could enhance the brick and mortar space where they may have vacancies. Welcome and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newberry. I'm a senior executive on call helping businesses in a make, move, sell flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca, or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, organizations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative, and digital with thought leaders, experts, and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here. So let's get started. This is a Retail Insider Podcast. You're listening to the interview series. Welcome to the Retail Insider Podcast. I'm your host today, Craig Patterson. And we're joined here today with two retail experts. We've got Gary Newbury. He's a senior executive on call, focused on rapid performance improvement in retail supply chains in the last mile, and the founder of RetailAid.ca. And we've got Jeff Davenport. He's a real estate analytics expert and strategist. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. This is a bit of a part two. We were talking about shopping centers and the future of uh, what we're seeing in North America. And uh, now we're going to talk a little bit more about the anchors uh, or former anchors, I guess we would say, <laughs> because we've seen many department stores over the last, uh, say, two to three decades shutting down in North America. And we're going to talk about both Canada and the United States because there are quite a few similarities around shopping centers. So let's start the conversation about department stores generally and see what are we seeing in terms of, you know, the fewer department stores within shopping centers in North America. And Jeff, you might have more insight, any statistics around that. Sure. In the United States, they track department store sales in their NAICS codes. And so you can look at how they've changed over time. And in 2000, that was the peak year for department store sales. They came in at around $232 billion. As of 2019, those sales had fallen to $135 billion. So they shaved almost $100 billion off of their sales figures over 19 years. 2020 was a bit of an outlier just due to you know the chaos and it came in at 113 billion so uh, a bigger it, they they had been losing about 5 billion dollars a year on average in sales and we'll see where they end up once 2020 and 2021 average out but i would guess it'd be around 130 billion dollars in sales uh, average between those two years so that's kind of where we are right now. We got this information from Directory of Major Malls, shoppingcenters.com. There are 258 regional and super regional malls in the U.S. and Canada that are grappling with at least one large anchor closure, most likely department stores. Of their data set, that represents about 18.3% of all regional and super regional malls that they track. So it's 
it's widespread, it's pervasive. And admittedly, they said, this is what we know of and can track. There's probably more out there than, than we have in our data set. And there's more coming. There were a lot of closures that, that have been announced, but they actually haven't happened yet. So they don't count it vacant. But just chip in and think about what's going on with that format. If, if the sales have gone off so badly, obviously somebody else has gained from it or different formats gained from it. And I suspect that is retailers like Walmart and Target. They they may look like the modern day department store plus others, other periphery stores. So people aren't going to department stores in the traditional sense of going in and getting all your housewares and clothes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that format is a very much a dying format. Well, for departments, well, every, every retail concept is served a department store because now the internet is the department store. Yeah. So that's where you can discover brands, where you can get stuff. Amazon. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. I mean, that's the department store. The shopping mall is a department store. The shopping mall itself. Everything. You know, the, the the parasite ate the host. It's true, isn't it? I'm still blown away that you know, we talked about this. I think last time that the department stores actually helped develop the shopping centers. In some cases, were the developers. And I'm thinking, well, that was like slow suicide because you, you basically created something that puts you out of business. Yes. Yeah. It's it's phenomenal. And then, you know, the internet came along. That wasn't department stores that did it, but certainly they participated in e-commerce and, and so did everyone else and their dog, right? Imagine how many more department stores there are in the U.S. today versus how many there were in 2000. The data set began in 1992 and sales back then were probably about $170 billion. They are very lean. Their sales figures go back to the, you know, a comparable, well, you'd have to go back to the 80s. Imagine how many more locations there are today versus back then. And the same holds true for Canada as well. Canada is interesting. If we're looking back to 1992, I, I have some information that very few people have around some sales numbers. You know, certainly in 92, we had just lost Simpsons department stores in Ontario. The Hudson Bay company actually had purchased the retailer, was a more upscale version of, of Hudson's Bay in about 1978, but shut the uh, business down in 1991. Woodward's, we saw the final stores close in 1993. So we did see quite a few of our department stores shut down in Canada fairly early on. We only have one traditional department store type retailer left in Canada, and that's the Hudson's Bay department store chain, which, you know, we used to have other ones in Canada. The United States still has has more than Canada in terms of a general selection. We, we literally have one traditional department store chain left in Canada. We lost Sears uh, in early 2018. I'm not sure. If, I don't think we would actually call Target a department store, but, you know, large format retailer. So we've, we've got smaller, well, not even that small. We've got Nordstrom, which I wouldn't call a department store, at least in a traditional sense. We've got Holt Renfrew, which is a high-end, um, large format retailer, a Neiman Marcus type of retailer with more concessions. But it's fascinating to see. And why I brought up the fact that I've got these sales numbers is that I was looking at the sales numbers uh, with a, a gentleman who had numbers from Eaton's department stores just before he went under in 1999. And we were shocked to see, not even including inflation, that uh, some of the sales numbers for the Eaton stores in the same malls where the Hudson Bay company currently has Hudson's Bay stores, the numbers, not including inflation whatsoever, are quite similar. So the sales numbers in some of these Bay stores are actually not that high. Quite fascinating, but at the same time, not a lot of those Bay stores are going to be closing anytime soon. That's more insider information. <laughs> it's fascinating to see where things are going or not going, where people expect Hudson's Bay to shut most of their stores, and, and I don't believe that's happening anytime soon. So, gentlemen, there have been a lot of vacancies in shopping centers, as we've talked about. What are we seeing in terms of redevelopment? these boxes or whatever has happened to the spaces where these large anchors were at one time? Boy, I think everywhere you look, it's, it's, they're replacing them with anything but retail. And part of that is, is getting back to a diversification, but not putting all your, your eggs in one basket. But what we see down here are rental apartments, hotels, big box retailers, sometimes They'll take a department store box and split it in half and put a Dick Sporting Goods in one. It's just those uh, power center large box retailers that we see come in sometimes, but not as often as we had prior to the, I guess, 2019. And restaurants and entertainment, that's the other. These are all complementary uses or these big box retailers are their own thing out there. They're going to draw their own customers that, that, that come in and fill that department store loss with driving traffic. But what I find so so painful to me about it is that there's nothing being done to support 
the small shop retailers that remain in that mall. And that's, that's when Gary and I really started talking and digging into this, this issue on how, how can a landlord support and protect or enhance the income stream they already have at their disposal? Yeah, I agree. Some of the aspects about Amal are generating excitement and excitement tends to come not from big box chains going into Mao's. People expect to see certain power retailers in there, but where the excitement comes from, from a retail point of view, is quite a lot of the independents who may struggle to stay in Amal and maybe they're not getting the right type of traffic or there's some issue that they go in and they come back out. What the important thing is, they bring excitement, they bring a unique proposition into the Mao, which is sometimes quite bland with the other banners, the, the chain banners. I think that's the the essence of retail is having that platform of, you know, the ones you expect to see there, but also lots of nooks and crannies for the independents with interesting propositions. And, and I think the larger issue here is, Yes, they're doing something. They're re- taking space and redeveloping it. But they need to first pay attention to how they support the heart of their property, which is that small shop space inside the mall. No, no one's going to want to go to a mall or go to a property at a mall where the, it's a dead mall. It's completely vacated. And you got a, an apartment complex attached to it or a hotel attached to it. It's going to drive down the property value of everything around it. So the the value of a mall is the retail itself. And there's things you can do to enhance that, but you can never take the retail out of a mall and think it's going to be okay. It's not going to be a mall. It's going to be a piece of real estate, right? That's right. It'll be something different. It won't, it won't be, it won't have, have what it has today. So, I mean, there's, you can always demolish it and do something different with it. But if you have any intention of, of keeping this as a viable shopping center in any way, shape, or form, you got to protect th- that that core portion of the property. Uh, I was just reading Sears Canada used to own, uh, through an acquisition, a, um, a parking lot and an old former Sears store at the Metropolis at Metrotown in Burnaby, which is in suburban Vancouver. What's interesting, a Concord Pacific bought the land, they're a developer, probably spent hundreds of millions of dollars because that's what land is worth in that part of Canada. And they're putting 10 condominium apartment building towers there. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. Like they will not have retail. They may have retail at the base that's, you know, mandated or whatever may serve the buildings above it, but it's a, it's a money-making scheme it, more than it is an effort to improve the shopping center itself. Now, granted, this was literally a different ownership than Ivanhoe Cambridge, which, you know, owns the metropolis and Metrotown itself. So Ivanhoe Cambridge didn't really have a say. They, they can't really say, well, we don't want you putting condo towers here. They're probably happy. Actually, they're going to get a whole bunch of new customers. They're going to literally live upstairs. But, but it's fascinating to see some of this redevelopment of these anchors, which uh, in some cases are going to be, you know, you're saying a sports store, a food, beverage, restaurant, entertainment. In some cases, these things will be torn down. In some cases, they'll become uh, distribution logistics centers, uh, which we'll talk about in a sec. This is where Gary will definitely be coming into this conversation quite a bit and uh, and other uses as well. And, and some of the, this is just a bit of an aside, but I was told, at least here in Canada and probably in the United States, that some of the older department stores in the shopping centers, older being, I mean, post-1950, but, you know, not very recent, or some of them were built so well that it's actually extremely difficult to tear them down. Like, they were built like bunkers, like you could try to set off a bomb and you're not going to blow this building up. So that in itself, I think, is going to be a challenge as we you know, see shopping centers at least being attempted to be redeveloped over the next uh, uh, few decades is the actual quality construction being detrimental to the sure. redevelopment effort. Absolutely. But there's a lot to talk about in all of that. Why are they doing what they're doing and why are they not paying attention more to the needs of their current tenants or, or maybe not even needs that they, they know of? So it it is perplexing to me to see them, you know, jump so hard at other uses. I'm not arguing against them. I'm just saying that there are things that they can do to enhance their current revenue stream. What about uh, micro-fulfillment in in shopping centers? Let's talk a bit about the omni-channel mall and and what we're starting to see because consumers are increasingly going online, but we also still have this physical world that we're we're dealing with. Craig, I, you know, I'd love to hear your definition of omnichannel. Would you mind sharing that with us? Oh, it's a word that isn't being used as much anymore. I mean, it's really that online in-store, the blurring, the lack of you know, differentiation, lack thereof, shop where, how, and what you want. It's, you know, 
<laughs> that, that's sort of where things have come, where you know, we're in a world where the digital and physical have merged. And I, sometimes I don't know if I go into an Apple store, I need a new computer. If they don't have something in stock, if I go, if I choose to go into the store, which I may not have to, I may, I could order something online in the store, outside the store, stand out in line and do it. It's everywhere, anywhere. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how I view it as well. Folks talk about having a storefront, brick and mortar storefront and an online website where you can order goods from the website or walk into the store and pick up your goods. But that's the hybrid. That's not omni-channel, right? I mean, so a lot of people think that's omni-channel because I've got a website and a store. Omni-channel is much more broad. In my mind, it stretches not just the shopping experience, but how do you get the goods experience, whether it's you know picked up in the store or brought to you immediately, or you have to wait a couple of days. And then there's that whole online presence of customers, the interaction online between retailers and customers. It's all encompassing. Plus in knowing more about your your customer via their data that they put online and keeping up with them and hopefully trying to, to serve them and cater to those guys by, by what the, you're seeing them talk about out in social media. It's so multi, multi-pronged, but there are some key components of that. Don't you think, Gary? Yeah, and one of the things that we often don't say as, as part of the old overall omni-channel retailing or combined retailing approach is, is returns. It's an inevitability. As a pandemic forced companies into lockdowns, their main revenue stream was, weirdly, e-commerce. And as a result of e-commerce, often a very high return rate. And so customers at one level love shopping in-store, online, whatever it might be, to have it delivered to, as as you were suggesting, wherever they happen to be in-store, in the mall, outside the mall, on the way to work, on the way to somewhere, or at home. So all these options are are, are all aspects of omni-channel. But one of the things that we still got to work on is returns, because this is a burden for for, uh, consumers. They they buy, you know, five uh, pieces of apparel, and they use their bedroom as their changing room, and now they need to return three. Oh, I have to take it back to a store, or I have to get a label and rebox it and send it back. It's a problem. And then they've got to struggle to get their refund. So we've got to, generally, in the retailer community, uh, which I, I embrace the, the Mao in that concept, is we have to also uh, address the the subject of returns. They are a big issue for consumers, and they can literally turn the fortune of a retailer. You're only as good as your last return. So do we believe that all retailers are going to have to adopt some sort of omni-channel process or, 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 or presence? There aren't many that are going to have to. <laughs> maybe... Maybe maybe your local super cheap convenience store that is grab and go, but even then, I mean, think Dollarama here in Canada has e-commerce. But if you, if you haven't got online or you're just in the early stages, think about blending the channels, not not thinking we've got our store channel, we've got our, our e-commerce channel, and keeping them separate, separate teams, separate organizational structures, separate ways of replanning them and, and, and fulfilling customers' orders. So we have to combine them. We have to find ways of integrating our internal processes because a customer doesn't really care about how you segregate things internally. They really don't give us stuff. We, we must take the lead from a consumer. They don't care, nor should we. And so, you know, if the retailers have to take the lead from the consumer, then the landlords have to take their lead from the retailers being led by the consumer, right? That would make logical sense. And so that, that means the landlords really need to get involved in the process of helping their retailers achieve some sort of omnichannel presence. And that's, you know, that's where the idea came from, is, is you're looking at a scattering of different companies under one roof that are probably too small individually to, to create an omni-channel presence. Look at the three that really do it and do it well here in the United States is Amazon, Walmart, and Target. And I think they still have further to go to, to achieve full omni-channel. But as far as who's out there today doing it the best here, it's those three. And it shows in their online sales and presence. We think that the small shop retailers, are, if they want to remain competitive, have to do it. And the only group that can pull all these guys together 
is the landlord who's got the roof over their head and, and they need to spearhead the effort. That's why we really think the landlords need to, to be involved and, and take these department stores and do something with these closed department stores and do something with them that supports this omni-channel effort the retailers need to achieve to remain competitive in the marketplace. And I wanted to ask specifically, this might be a bit more of a question for Gary, but you know, in terms of micro-fulfillment centers, once operational, how would they function, I guess, from a broad standpoint? And, uh, and yeah, I mean, let, let's get into that conversation a little bit in terms of, you know, and then retailers and consumers, how they can benefit from this as well. Yeah. Let's just sort of step back and try and understand what a micro-fulfillment center is. And, and it, it can operate in two, two ways. It can actually be a physical manual operation. So it would be a small-scale warehouse. So you may have 10,000 SKUs in it and you have pickers going around and actually picking it on behalf of the customers, whoever they might be. It could be, if you're in a mall, could be obviously the retailers. Mm. Or you could go down a much more uh, sophisticated route, which is to run an automated and miniaturized version of a warehouse. So in a space of about 10,000 square feet, you could actually house maybe 50,000 SKUs. You could probably do a lot more than that. If you, if you knew the rate of sale of a cube, you could actually take the, the, the units of holding, which are typically something like a blue tote bin and divide into different things. So you could actually really multi multiply up your, your ability to hold lots of different products available to the e-commerce stream as such. When we think about that operation, and, and we think about the, the general footprint of a department store, which might be you know, 100,000, 150,000 square foot. In the space of 10,000 square foot, we can hold like 50 or 60,000, maybe more. If we start to think about the micro-fulfillment concept multiplied several times within that same space, we could be holding 2 million SKUs very easily. And the, the benefit of, of the automation is that you can put an order in, press select and you could have it within minutes whereas typically when you're running a conventional operation a manual operation you put an order in you have to plan it you have to release a pick wave you have to allocate a picker you have to give them some instruction they go around they chat to their mates they finally get the picking done and it could be an hour before you actually see an output they also have unlike staff they don't they don't take time off it's always there, it's always ready to go. So we can use the micro fulfillment center to do a number of things. The first one is that obviously things like click and collect or making goods ready for home delivery. The other one is to replenish your stores. Now, if we think about our current situation where people feel a little bit unsafe about going into stores, going down narrow aisles and stuff like that, imagine a world where we only have to have a day's worth of stock in a store because we're not waiting for a truck to come in before we mm. you know, put it into our back room and then flood the, the store floor where we need lots of shelving. Imagine a world where perhaps we think about our SKUs, what we want to have in now in our sales space, but we also get from the micro fulfillment center, which is in the vacant uh, anchor store, a, a nightly feed to top up those shelves. We can probably take the shelf facing will be needing to be smaller. They don't need to be as long because we're not having a week's worth of stock in there. And we can start thinking about taking some of the shelving out to give a much more kind of boutique-y, luxurious kind of look and feel for the store. We can actually move from a traditional bricks and mortar store thinking like, you know, you know there's some there's stuff on the shelf come in and we kind of serve you to a much more showroomy kind of situation where you can rely on the fact that you've got stock really close to hand and it comes overnight for normal replenishment, but also you could operate an endless aisle concept where you have stuff in the store, which you've got available for like the common sizes of say footwear or whatever, but you've got access to the unusual footwear sizes within say 10 minutes. If you think about the typical department store as it was trading, they'd say, oh, we've, we've got that back at warehouse. We can have it to you tomorrow or two days time when the truck comes in. From a customer service experience, that's not really particularly brilliant because I have to come back to them now. So there's lots of things the center can actually provoke, facilitate, and, and for retailers to perhaps embrace a different way of thinking 
about what's the purpose of a store? How can we use the store in a slightly different way? How can we create more excitement in the store? And that micro fulfillment can help that along. I think it all can also help bring in digitally native brands, right? That may not, or maybe thinking about a brick and mortar presence or a specific and checking out markets that way. I mean, it could allow them to test the water before taking the plunge in the brick and mortar, but it would also help build that relationship if the landlord, uh, mall landlord is running the MFC. We could, are you calling it the mall fulfillment center now? Is that, is that what we've decided? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Craig's named it. He's taken that copyright. <laughs> it, it, it can just help them get in and meet that digitally native tenant and start a conversation with them. And, and maybe something comes of it and, and maybe it doesn't. And they, they get booted out of the MFC. Yeah. And, and just to think a bit wider than just like what we might consider to be bricks and mortar retail. If we, if we have retailers, which might be food service, that can go into the micro fulfillment center. That can provide that service to restaurants and entertainment facilities with, within that situation from the micro fulfillment center. They can get their big trucks coming in once every two or three days, put it into a micro fulfillment center and feed across to, to these other facilities to, to support their businesses. Because one of the things in food services that they want little and often, but the truck doesn't arrive with little and often. Interesting. My goodness. And I guess the final, I don't want to say thought, but overall conversation is you know, the future of how will mall landlords and tenants will be working together, whether or not that's micro fulfillment or, or, or even sort of smaller retailers looking for a bit of insight here. Uh, Jeff, you'd put together a bit of a overview editorial. Tell me what you're thinking. Can, can landlords and tenants work together to get this done? I know they can. I just don't know if they will. I don't think they have a choice. I think you have a window of opportunity here, Craig, where you've got, you've got empty boxes on your property that you need to do something with. And if you lose three out of four department stores when it's all said and done, and you have three different uses, you put an office, uh, an apartment, and a, a hotel where the department stores used to be, you've missed the opportunity. And you're never going to get it again. And I, I think that this is a window. They, everybody needs to put down their swords, understand they need each other to survive. It's been a bumpy 10 or 15 years between retailers and their landlords, without a doubt. You know, there's been a lot of things haven't been great there. It hasn't been an apocalypse, but they sure as heck haven't been great either. So there's been a lot of stress between the, that relationship. and. I think they've got to figure out how to get it done. Because if they don't, the property is not going to be competitive. I think you've heard me say it before, murder or suicide. If, if somebody really wants to litigate this thing into never happening, I suppose that they could. But I'm hopeful that they reach out and they take the new technology that's out there and, and wrap their arms around it and, and do something with it that's productive for the tenants that they already have. Yeah, and to that point, really, the technology, the micro fulfillment concept, the miniaturization of warehousing and automation within that, some part of this has been around for 20 years, but never at the kind of scale that is available now. We've got so many new players saying, what about my, my solution? It's brilliant. You know, we can leapfrog. If we were trying to do this 10 years ago, uh, we'd probably talk about thematics and, you know, what, what's that about? Well, they can't get to us for another 18 months because they, they're, they're all the books for anyway. But now we've got so many players that can help get us uh, as Mao, as, as, as you know, partners, retail partners, get us quickly into position with a lot of different options, a lot of uh, scalability in, in, in these solutions, a lot of reliability in these solutions to allow, once we make that psychological jump to we have to collaborate, we're both in this boat together. That implementation of an MSC is relatively straightforward. I think this is one of the most important parts. You've seen when Walmart announced that it was, you know, acquiring Jet and going to invest more heavily in a marketplace solution, their stock got a huge boost. And, you know, as we look at 
can this be done? And, 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 you know, if so, how do we pay for it? I think it would really pay for itself. I think the first landlord to announce that they're doing this would be rewarded by analysts and investors and hopefully their tenants as well, who need this help to go to the, to an omnichannel presence. I think the rewards would be immense and they would see a huge boon in their stock price that, that could really just offset the cost of investment for doing it. Not to mention build new bridges out to those digitally native retailers that could enhance the brick and mortar space where they may have vacancies. Oh, it sounds great. Well, we've run out of time here, gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, the input and the discussion today. The future of shopping centers is very interesting. We also did a uh, part one of a podcast talking about the future general redevelopment of shopping centers, as well as what might be done to keep those retail elements to make them interesting. So uh, thank you again. We've got Gary Newbury. He's a senior executive on call focused on rapid performance improvement in retail supply chains in the last mile and founder of RetailA.ca. And Jeff Davenport, welcome back again. He's a real estate analytics uh, specialist and strategist. And thank you so much, gentlemen, both of you for being on the podcast here today. Thanks for having us, uh, Craig. Thanks so much, Craig. Great, great being here. And I'm Craig Patterson, editor-in-chief of Retail Insider and the host of the Retail Insider podcast here today. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Take care and bye for now. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your team. You can connect with me via the website retail.ca and go to the contact page or via LinkedIn by typing linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash last dash mile. Look forward to hearing from you and playing an active part with your supply chain and your business's transformation as you start to act boldly Think big, scale, adapt, and win. Thank you.